Good morning, and we welcome you to our Sunday morning Bible class. No, I'm not Kevin Ballard. I know so many of you tuning in this morning, and others will throughout the week, expecting to see Kevin and participate at home in his wonderful Bible classes. Kevin has had an attack of pancreatitis, and he's in the hospital this weekend. He went to the ER a couple of days ago with pain, and they've decided to keep him and run tests and try to figure out just what triggered that attack and what he needs to be doing and the treatment that he needs to receive. So this morning, we would say that Kevin is right where he needs to be. There are good people taking care of him, and I'm filling in, and I don't know if it'll be just for this Sunday morning or for a week or two or three. We'll do whatever we need to do. The most important thing, of course, is that we remember Kevin, his good wife Kelly, in our prayers, and he'll be back with us very soon, Lord willing. And in fact, as we begin this morning, why not? Let's have this prayer together. Our dear Father, we're mindful of our brother Kevin and this sudden difficulty that he's going through and the pain and the discomfort that he's dealing with. And our prayer will be that those that are treating him those that are administering the test, they'll determine just exactly what he needs and what they can do. And then by thy amazing grace and by thy healing power, Kevin will be able to be back with us soon. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this morning, not knowing whether to put together a short series of one or two or three or four lessons and just what to do and kind of wanting to be a placeholder until Kevin is back with us and he continues his studies on the topic of baptism. I thought, well, we'll be flexible and we'll talk about something this morning and if that's a one and done, that's great, that's the way we'll do it, and Kevin will be back next week. If we need to go a week or two or three, we can somewhat stretch this out. There's plenty of material, but what we're going to be talking about is something that's familiar, I know, to all of us, but it's a look at an examination of the relationship between that portion of God's holy word that we call the Old Testament and the New Testament and how they fit and how they relate and how that we understand how they are alike and how they are different. A long, long time ago, and here's a name that you're probably familiar with if you wouldn't necessarily pretend or presume to know all the many things that he wrote. Augustine, a bishop, you and I would call him an elder, except by the time Augustine lived, that New Testament office had evolved into something different than we read in simple scripture. Augustine was a bishop in North Africa, and he was born in the year 354 and died about the year 430. So here is a man that's living and working and writing 400 years after Jesus is born. And that's a long time removed from the age of the apostles, but Augustine was a very gifted man, a very insightful man in any number of ways. And here's one of his best known quotes. The Old Testament is in the New Testament. Well, we know that, don't we? You've got a Bible with you, I suppose. Just open it up at random to any page in your New Testament, 
and run your finger down and if you have a reference Bible, you'll see the Old Testament quoted. How many times? On every single page. So, yes, we read the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. There it's revealed. And the New Testament is the Old Concealed. And someone else has illustrated it by that drawing that you might see there on the bottom left-hand corner. And when we think of this relationship between the old and the new, well, that's one of the good things, the first things, the obvious things that good Bible students appreciate. And then maybe to go just a little bit farther down that road, Here's another way that perhaps I would illustrate it by just a few simple lines or arrows. And there you'll see the left hand bottom corner of your screen. And this is not profound and not scholarly. But I think for most of us, with just a little bit of explanation, we can see what we're getting at. You know, some people, when they read the Bible, they read the Bible. And Old Testament, New Testament, well, the Old Testament is older, written long before the books of the New Testament, of course, but it's all the Bible. And say I'm interested in a particular topic. And maybe it's worship. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's sacrifice. It doesn't really make any difference whether I'm looking at the book of Genesis or Paul's letter to the Romans. If it's in the Psalms or the Proverbs or if it's in Samuel or Kings or Chronicle, or if it's in the Acts of the Apostles, the Bible is the Bible. And why? Certainly there are some differences, unimportant distance differences really, in the Old and the New Testament. And it's all God's Word. It's all God's revelation. And that would be one of the things that we might hear and nod. Yes, there's something about that. And it's true. It's kind of true, but it's not altogether true. What does God want me to do? How does God want me to live? What does God expect me to do? Well, if I go to Genesis chapter 6, and I kind of have the notion that Old Testament, New Testament, it's all just the Bible. It flows together. And there's very little important distinction between the two. God told Noah to build an ark for the saving of his family. Does God want me to build an ark in my backyard? Well, no. And so we'll see that as far as one long uninterrupted stream or stream, God's word is progressive and flowing. And there are different covenants, arrangements, relationships, commandments. And the way that God related the people 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Well, yes, he's the same God, and some principles are enduring and eternal, but the specifics of the covenant, why, that changes. Our sacrifice is not the sacrifice that the people of Israel made in the days of the old kingdom of Israel and Judah. Why, we can't even go to a temple. That temple built in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians and then by 
the Romans and it no longer stands. And there's a different kind of priesthood today as well as a different sacrifice today. So, yes, it's all the Bible. It's all true. But, you know, it's just like our changing law, our constitution in this country can be amended and added on to. And just so God and his dealings with people in the long ago, we can see differences in what he wanted them to do and what he commanded them to do while they were wandering in the wilderness. And later on, under Joshua and the judges, later on, under David and the kings, later on, when Jesus the Christ came, so that first era, which is just one solid line pointing to the left and the right, that would kind of illustrate one way that some people look at the Bible the Old and the New Testament, and very little important difference between the two. And then those second eras. And there you'll notice that they're bumping up against each other. And that's my very simple way of illustrating some people would pit and contrast the Old Testament against the New Testament. Now then, you'll not hear this in a Bible class, not at the Pikes Peak Church of Christ, not a good class that Kevin teaches, not even the classes that I would teach or anyone else, that there's a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. Have you heard that? Every now and then, we hear something that smacks of that, why the Old Testament God is a God of wrath and fury. He's a God that commanded entire peoples to be wiped out, and not just the fighting men, but the women and the children and their flocks and their herds. And he's sometimes described by people that apparently don't know any better. He's described as a cruel God, a God of war and blood and punishment and wrath. But, you know, the New Testament has a different flavor, a different attitude, a different spirit. And there we see an evolution of God and how that he's a God of love and mercy, and compassion. And in seminar seminaries all over the world, very learned professors, they'll contrast the old parts of the Bible with the newer parts of the Bible. And they will suggest that they are all together and completely irreconcilable. And they're at one another and against one another. But then that era on the bottom there in the left-hand corner, the era that starts this way and then goes up, well, again, that's my very simple way of illustrating that there was an old covenant, an older revelation, God's dealings with his people in the long, long ago. But God was building toward something. God was moving to a goal. God had a purpose in mind, a plan that he was following. And with the coming of Jesus, there we find a whole new chapter, a whole new revelation, a whole new covenant. So the new grows out of and it's based upon and built upon that which we would call the old. Now then, 
for so many of us. And I wouldn't go too far out on a limb and just guess right now for the people watching this. This is old news. This is Understanding the Bible 101. This is the very basic foundational block that there's the Old Testament and the New Testament and we understand and appreciate the relationship. And I don't know if in the past 1,500 years anyone has ever said it better than Augustine did. Well, the old is in the new. And the new is that old concealed. And we understand that when we read our Bible. Now then, for the remainder of our time this morning, let's just illustrate it with three simple things. Because there is a connection, because there is a continuity between the old and the new, why, you and I, we're not the least bit surprised when we read about something in the old and then hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, when we read about it in the new, it has a deeper, more spiritual, more relevant meaning to you and all of us who are living today. Now then that first thing, that first item that we'll look at that demonstrates the linkage, the connection between what you and I call the Old Testament and the New Testament early on, in fact, at the very beginning in Genesis, we read about the tree of life. And then in the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, we again read about the tree of life. And for good measure, there are a few references, what we might call in the middle of the Bible, there in the book of Proverbs, but the tree of life. Now then we're going back to the time of the beginning when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. In fact, we'll find there in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, there are two trees singled out for specific mention. And we're not talking about the oak and the pine and the poplar and other trees. Genesis 2 and verse 9, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve, Eve had sinned and disobeyed the command of God, you'll remember God said, Every tree in all the garden you may freely eat, but there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat. Well, they did. You know that. You remember that. And so in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever. And then in verse 24, so God drove out the man. He placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Well, I don't know as if I know. You know, I don't know if anyone knows altogether a whole comprehensive encyclopedia depth of knowledge about the tree of life, but here was a tree in the garden, and evidently we take the Bible at face value. If you ate of the fruit of that tree, then Life everlasting. Well, I don't know if that would be a one-time sampling of the fruit. Or 
If that would have been part of Adam and Eve's daily diet, something that would be regular and frequent, none of that makes any difference at all, of course. But here we find the Lord God saying, if they eat of the tree of life, and they were expelled from the garden, and the garden was barred to them, lest they partake of that tree of life. Tree of life. Well, you know, in the Word of God, we read about the book of life and the names that are in there. Well, that's self-explanatory. The water of life, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 17. Jesus is called the Word of life, and I take this to mean Life giving. God's word brings us spiritual life. The water of life, to drink it. There's that water that quenches all spiritual thirst and satisfies and sustains. And so too the fruit of the tree of life. Well, in Proverbs, we read a couple of mentions about the tree of life, and there we find how that wisdom is described as a tree of life to those who lay hold on her. And that would be found in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 18. Proverbs 11 and verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And then in chapter 13 and verse 2, when desire is fulfilled, is as a tree of life. Chapter 15 and verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. But you know, it's when we come over to this last book of the Bible and Revelation and that spiritual vision of our new home, here's where it all ties together. In the beginning, God made a home for the man and the woman that he created. And there they were to live and enjoy sweet fellowship and closeness with God, but temptation and sin marred and destroyed that tranquility. And Adam and Eve were cast out of that garden, that place of peace and safety, and they no longer had access to that tree of life. But then in this closing, this consummate vision of the revelation, there's new heavens and a new earth. There's a new city, a new Jerusalem, a new home, a new place where God gathers his beloved close to him. And isn't it fitting and isn't it wonderful that here is paradise lost and paradise regained or restored. I wish I had thought of that and was the first to coin those phrases, but of course I'm not. Paradise lost and paradise rediscovered and even better, grander, greater, more sweeping, more beautiful, more everlasting than that garden of Eden at the beginning. There's the home of the soul, and there we will live forever and ever and have right, have access to the tree of life. And there our dwelling will be with Almighty God forever. So here I think is a good, familiar, and obvious illustration that there is a thread that runs through God's Word. And we see this linkage and connection from Genesis, the first book, to the Revelation, the last book, man's first home and man's last home, that is, those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb and those that God brings into his fellowship, God's family. And then that second item that we're looking at is every bit as familiar as the first, 
the manna. The manna that God promised there in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 4 to Israel, wandering in the wilderness, wandering, wandering and wandering Israel. Where's our next meal coming from? Where will we find food? Where, we, where will we find water in this desolate, hostile land? God says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And we'll not go into detail about the manna because once again, good Bible students that you are, you'll remember the basic and the fundamental details that there on days one through six, there was the bread, the manna. The word manna, a play on words in the original that means, what is this? That's what the Israelites asked when they first saw it. And it was upon the ground, and it's described as a wafer that tasted of honey. And Israel would gather that for food. You'll remember that on the Sabbath, there was no bread from heaven and no gathering. And so on the day before, there was a double portion that the people of Israel would gather. And once again, this is so familiar to us, but the idea is that while God's people were wandering and while they were in their wilderness years, God fed God cared, God provided for his people. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul gave a spiritual spin or twist to that manna under the old covenant and the spiritual food in under the new, but we'll probably want to think more for just a minute in John chapter 6. Jesus is being challenged by those people of his day and age that found it hard to believe in him and on him. And they said to Jesus, give us a sign, show us a wonder, rear back and do a miracle so that we may see it and believe. What work are you going to do for us? And then they cited one and said, how about something like this? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Anybody ever challenge you with a question, and as they've asked it, you've just done a silent, secret celebration? That was the very question I could have hoped they would have asked. That's what's going on in John chapter 6. Jesus said, I say to you, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you you today would be the idea, the true bread from heaven. They said, Jesus, give us this bread also. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Every now and then, before the Lord's Supper, John chapter 6 is read. And I don't make a big deal of it. But John chapter 6 is not a commentary on the body of Jesus and the Lord's Supper, that sacrifice. Context matters. And when we take a passage of Scripture where the application that we bring to it isn't anything, any part of it, we need to be more careful than that. Jesus is talking about himself, my teaching my leadership, my guidance, my promise, my salvation. And if you will have anything to do with God and his fellowship, that demands that you embrace me, that you ingest me in much the same way that you would the bread of life. Manna in the morning, well, again, that's a title that I kind of wish I had thought of first, but I didn't. But see how that under the Old Testament, God gave manna, that bread-like substance, to sustain Israel in a better, fuller, more complete way. Jesus is the bread of life for us all today.
And then so very quickly, our third and final item that we'll look at this morning, illustrating the connecting, the linkage between the old and the new. There we read in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers how that the children of Israel sinned again, complained again, disappointed God again, and Moses erected that serpent of brass that if Israel would look upon it, then they might live and not perish from the awful tragedy and the biting of the fiery serpents and Jesus himself cited that illustration. In John chapter 3, you know verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Well, just the immediate verses before that, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness long ago, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our conclusion then. No, the Old and the New Testament are not warring with one another. And the Old and the New Testament are not exactly the same. Quote one, quote the other. What it says in the Old, what it says in the New, no matter, the Bible is the Bible, no, a better and fuller understanding is that there's this growing, swelling, progressive, always upward, fuller, richer, deeper, more profound. Here's the story of God's ongoing revelation, and we see that in oh so many ways, three simple ways this morning. And that's our class. There we see that relation between the old and the new covenant. Thank you so much for being with us. In just a moment, our worship stream will begin, and we invite you to stay tuned. And we'll be back in just a moment. Surely did get quiet fast. Uh, I'm up here to welcome everybody here today. So welcome. Well, good to see you all. While I'm yakking for just a minute, if you haven't yet picked up your personal communion device, it not be a good time to do it. We've got some back there, some back there, some back there. Uh, well, this is the first time I've done this for quite a while, I don't know what to say. You don't have any books to mark anything in, so I already made that mistake once. Glad to have you all here, especially those of you who are visiting. Glad that you made it here today. Hope that uh, you'll be uplifted. And uh, before we get into it, let's have it. Dear God, I want to thank you so much for blessing us with this day. Thank you for the chance that we have to take a break from the rest of our lives busyness that we have in our everyday lives sometimes we get from Thank you for loving us and bringing us together as a family. Pray God that you be on our hearts and our minds today and help us to not only hear the words that are being said, but to hear the thoughts and, and, and motives and meanings behind it. Pray God that we'll be enlightened in some way today that maybe we haven't been up to this point. I don't know how to move of your word. Please help us, God, to remember these things and, and, and make them part of the actions that we do in our lives. Help us, God, to be a light before the world. I pray to you. Glory to us for the rest of this time that we have together. Please be with uh, Chris, as he leads us in song, and with great as he brings the message to us. I pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. Because I was going to be glad to be one. 
Let's go with yonder.
Walking alone at even, viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcoming silver star. I am a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in His power and might is showing His Extra candle up here that 
kind of obscure level for us, but that means that Kevin and I, they'll have to be anchored up there in the pulpit. And uh, we have some nervous energy so we can kind of be closer to you and walk back and forth a few steps and you have no idea after six months now, sitting right there in front of the camera or standing in front of the camera, how free and liberating this is. So we're looking at Psalm number four this morning. It's up there on the screen, but even better if you look at your Bible and look at it. And when you and I feel it, now we're in the book of Psalms, that's the psalm book of ancient Israel. Many of them written by David. Many of them written by people that we're not exactly sure. There's no title. There's no signature. There's no accreditation. And the psalms cover subjects from wall to wall. They are prayers. There are prayers, there are laments, there are celebrations and rejoices. And no doubt that's one reason why a lot of us, no matter what mood we're in, what challenge we're facing, what difficulty might arise, there's words of wisdom that we can find in the book of Psalms, and it just seems to fit, and fit like a glove just snug and tight. Psalm number four. A lot of people think Psalm number three and four go together. And that's why they're found back to back. We're not exactly sure who put the Psalms in the order they have today, but maybe there's something to them. If you look at the inscription or the historical note, Psalm number three, the credit gives, the credit says that this is a song that David wrote while he was fleeing from Absalom. Chapter 4 doesn't have that identifying information, but maybe Psalm 4, because of the similarity in language and some of the shared themes, maybe they're bookends and they go together. And a lot of people, they will see in the songs when it mentions praise and worship and sacrifice, this is what our mind flashes to. And if we have more time this morning, and maybe our object, our attention wasn't so much on our worship to God, we would love to study that slide a little bit longer, five or six years ago. Some of those dear, sweet people are no longer with us, but we're going to see them again one day. And we can hardly wait. But this is a worship context in the church building. And a lot of us, when we hear the word worship, that's the knee-jerk response. That's what we think about first. Well, our worship that's what we do when we all come together in a church building, say, well, worship is that, but it's that and a lot more. Psalm 3, because it talks about rising up. Some see in that, well, here's the rest through the night. And now David is ready to face a new day by the help and the strength of God. Psalm number four, there at the close, talks about lying down on the bed. And so many suggest that maybe this is a good way to approach these two psalms or poems. There's an evening prayer upon one's bed. And then there's prayer for resolve and strength as we get up and go on and we face the new day. But this morning, we're not going to be looking at all eight verses. We're only going to limit our attention to two verses. Psalm number four, verse four, and verse five. And we'll look and see how these tie together Verse 4, we'll look at that first. 
being and sin law. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. And then in a few moments, verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Verse 4 and verse 5. Here's a way that we're going to approach that this morning, and I'll freely confess, I'll acknowledge, I'll give credit where it's due. When I was a boy and a very, very young man, one of the most prolific, one of the most gifted, one of the most insightful writers in our brotherhood was this fellow, Leslie G. Thomas, I never had the pleasure of hearing him in person. Never had the pleasure of meeting him. He was born in Gibson County, Tennessee, buried in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and that's about the only connection I suppose I have with him, other than he was my brother in Christ. But he would write a number of things that I would read and then I would scribble a note on the side and file away. And a lot of the notes going back through the stacks of stuff that I had. And I'm at a particular age now that I'm reading through a lot of it and throwing a lot of it away. There's some handwriting I can't even read after these years, and it's my handwriting. And there are papers that I'm scanning in with a digital scanner so that I can throw the paper away in the notebooks and free up some space. And here's a note that flowed into the service a few weeks ago. And I thought at the time that's an odd take on Psalm number four. And there you can see the quotation that I've seen around. A statement of the four acts which belong to the birth of a religious life or a righteous life. And my scribbled note from 40 some odd years ago said, Now then, wait a minute. The birth of a righteous life. And Psalm 4, according to all the evidence that we can muster, and all the hints and clues that we can gather, David didn't write this as a shepherd boy. David didn't write this when he was a youth going out to challenge Goliath. If it's dating from the time that he's fleeing from Absalom, David is a mature man. He's a grown man. And the birth or the beginning of a righteous life, well, that doesn't seem to fit. But then through the years, as I would kind of bump up against this every now and then, I think I saw what Brother Thomas suggested. What to you is the mark? Identifying characteristics of someone that we might call religious. Righteous, God, spiritual. You know, if you were to make a list, ten things, five items, the top three, and you're talking about a godly man, a godly woman, a religious person, a spiritual person, well, what do they do? What do they say? How do they act? What makes you think they're righteous? And once again, I will fall back. The fault position would be, would it not? Well, I see them in our church services. And he leads singing, and she teaches a class. And they're present every time the doors are open. And I infer from that their faith, their religion means something to them something important to them. And that would be right. But now that Brother Thomas is looking at these songs or poems, and their lonely poems, lying in one's bed at night all alone, 
rising up from a night where doubts and confusion and fears have tormented and terrorized and finding the strength to go out and face the devil. Something that comes from within, and he says, when you think about it, maybe the real proof or even the text, one of the sure signs of what we might call a righteous, religious awakening. David is counting four things right here. Well, every preacher steals other preachers' outlines and then modifies them. And so that's what I've done. Brother Thomas's four points, I've reduced to two points. You've read the Psalms, haven't you? You know something about what we sometimes call Hebrew parallel construction. You read part of one verse, and the rest of the verse says almost the same thing, but it says it just slightly different. And so there is a way of saying the same thing twice, kind of like taking a cold. And it has two sides, and you turn it around. And so the psalmist will make a statement, offer a declaration, and then say it again, not exactly word for word, but close to word for word, but he's getting at the same idea. Sometimes the psalmist will say this, and then he will say something that gives a counterbalance to that. And it's a contrast. And this is true, but then an exception or some other situation is considered in conjunction with that. Well, when David is talking about something that he's going through, I think maybe not four separate things, but two separate things, and the two were tied together into one. Let's look at verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. If you're reading from the stately, old, dignified King James translation, stand in awe. And then if you're reading from the New American Standard, the English Standard, the NIV, they'll probably use the word trim, trim, and do not sin. And then in smaller type at the bottom of the screen, in your anger do not sin, when you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. And that's from a commentary that a man named Boris wrote and translated the Hebrew himself. And the idea here, you're lying in your bed and you're troubled. There's an instant replay, and it's over and over and over of what's bothering you, and you can't let it go. You know what David was talking about? Is that you? It's me sometimes. And whether it's silly or whether it's serious, whether someone said something, did something, whether it's something that's more inanimate, Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a bill coming to you. Maybe it's some of the struggle and sorrow that's gripping our country that Brother Billy prayed about a few minutes ago. And the sense of helplessness, what can we do about that? But there we are, alone at night, even if we can reach over and touch someone. We're alone in our heart, we're alone in our mind, we're alone in our struggle. And here the word tremble seems to suggest a reaction from that. The word translated tremble or be angry found 41 times in the Old Testament. And it's translated shake, quake, tremble, be upset, fly into a passion, agitate, rise up, excite oneself. The word literally means this, shaking. Well, in Old Testament 
times, New Testament times too, that the people of Palestine would go out with sticks and rods. And they would hit and beat upon the olive tree at a certain time of the year so that the olives could fall down on the ground and they would have a cloth covering and they could gather them up and the limbs of the tree would tremble. Well, that's what the word means. But when it comes to a person, there's an agitation. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's some other powerful raw emotion. But here David is saying, as I lie awake at night, here's what's bothering me and the reaction that it has upon me. This verse is found in the Greek Old Testament that the Apostle Paul used. And over in Ephesians chapter 4, you'll remember he talked about do be angry, but do not sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians chapter 4. Well, that was the translation. And it's getting at what David is saying here. When my life does it suit me, and when it feels like my life is caving in all around me, even at night, no pretense at night. No false face to wear the fool others. Not the lackadaisical attitude of nothing bothers me when we're alone all by ourselves at night. There might be some of the most honest thing that we're capable of doing. David says, when I'm frustrated and angry and trembling alone, here's what comes over me. And then David says, when that happens, I need the food, I need the ponder, I need the meditate. And if the word translated tremble is found 41 times in all the Old Testament, this word translated meditate, ponder, search, again in the old King James, commune with your own heart. There's a word that's found in the Old Testament more than 5,200 times. It's one of the most common words in all the Hebrew Old Testament. And it's a word that can mean anything from I say, I shall, I declare, I say to myself, I rumble and ruminate within my own mind and heart and soul. It's a word that can mean to mumble. You know how it is when you take a glance, see some writing, and you instantly know what it says, and you know what it means, and that's that. And when you know how sometimes we are in our Bible study, we have an open Bible and we trace it with our finger. And maybe there's a part that we go back and we read again and reread it. And sometimes we read it not to someone, but to ourselves out loud, kind of way. Well, here's what David is saying, and here's the meaning behind this. When I'm alone and my life seems to be falling apart, I don't need to give myself over to anger. What does that solve? I don't need to pitch a fit and throw a thoughts. What good does that do? When I'm lying there on my bed, on my bed alone, I need to meditate. And I need to ponder. And I need to think about this. The English Standard Version. Offer right sacrifices. And put your trust in the Lord. David said, even though I'm he, I'm rude, I'm warm. I'm gentle. I'm commander-in-chief. I have a house full of wives and children. And there are all the surrounding signs of my status and power and standing 
And yet, my enemies are strong and powerful, and there's a conspiracy against me, and my enemies seek to overthrow me, and my wives are quarreling, and my children are plotting against me. On the outside, it looks so serene and beautiful. On the inside, it's a churning, boiling pot. Rather than give myself over to anger and frustration, I need to pardon. And I need to turn things on to my God. You've heard that little saying, haven't you? Let go, let God. Or you can put it on a t-shirt. You can put it on a bumper sticker. It's a Facebook link. It's something that we can say, and it's one of those things that we can have in our arsenal, and we can just pull it out as the occasion demands. Well, you're thinking too much. You're worrying too much. Don't you know that God has got this? Well, sometimes that devolves into a bit of pop psychology. But in essence, that's what David is saying to himself here in Psalm 4, verses 4 and 5. When I think I've got to do something to fix this, solve this, David is saying the paraphrase, well, I'm putting too much stock in myself. When I'm thinking and worrying and keeping myself away, this is beyond my control. Well, it is, but it's not beyond his control. Psalm 4, there the opening verse that we took as the title for our thoughts this morning. And hear my prayer. Some people are topic personalities. Maybe you're wrong. We've got some here at Pikes Peak. And somebody might hold up a mirror so that I can see myself in it. I don't know. But there's a lot of us, and if it can be fixed, it can be corrected. If I need to double down and grit my teeth and do more, well then, let's get on with that. And David, I suspect, was that kind of a fellow. But here alone is not. And not only an honest to God prayer to the Father, but an honest to himself assessment and evaluation. David is saying, the trouble in my life is beyond me. But I can let go. And I can't let go. I'll not be angry, frustrated. My trembling will pass. And I won't plot and give myself over to revenge and other sinful acts. But instead, I'll commune with my own heart and I will trust in the Lord. Maybe that's a lesson for COVID 19 times. But that's a lesson for all of time. That's a reminder for those who are walking in the footsteps of Jesus. That's a reminder for all of us as we think about our movement, our response, our reliance, and how it needs to be upon the Almighty. David says, and O oh Lord, hear my prayer, and it's a prayer that is less of me and more of thee. We sing an old song that has that in the stanza. And when you think about what Jesus asks, what Jesus requires, he would say it differently than King David did. Jesus would say, if any man is to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Well, in a sense, a thousand years before Jesus, that's what David is saying. I need to deny myself 
This is beyond me. And I need to put my faith and trust and hope and surrender rule all together in the hands of my heavenly Father. That's what David did. It's what I need. And that's what you need as well. And it could be as we reach this point at the close of our lesson, if there is an awareness of your own, maybe you haven't put on the Lord Jesus in baptism. Maybe you have not surrendered on. Maybe you've never reached the point, some crisis of faith, some danger, some disturbance in your life that's made you yearn for a rock, a tower, a pillar, a help and a hope. And you need to understand that Jesus is our loving Savior and he's all of that and more and you've not yet surrendered your life and walk to be a follower of his this morning, if that's your need and result, could we help you in any way while we stand it as we sing this song to you?
It's now time for the Lord's Supper. If you uh, haven't picked up the, the communion material, uh, there, there's baskets on the uh, entrance. Before the Lord went to the cross, he gathered all of his disciples together and he laid out the memorial that we are participating in now. And then he, then he proceeded to go to the cross to, uh, to sacrifice his life for us. Luke 22, starting in verse 14 says, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the total apostles with him. He said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand, uh, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. In, in reading these verses, we see the determination, the, the desire to complete his task on this earth, to, to, uh, to give up himself for us so that we might have a place in heaven with him. And we get a glimpse of the kind of love that he had when he considered uh, that we, uh, simple people, uh, would um, would have a would have a place with him because of what he's done. Let's pray. Dear Father, at this time we we come together and our minds go to the cross where your Son laid down his life for all of us. Although we uh, were weak and simple, you have raised us up by what, by, what you, by what he has done. Father, we remember his pain and suffering there. We remember uh, that, that, uh, that, that you were the one that, um, that brought us out of, uh, of our, our sin and bondage. Father, as we partake of this bread that represents his body, we pray that we do so in a manner that pleases you. Father, we, we give thanks. For, for you and, and, and for our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
for for for, for uh, giving your your offering. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so blessed uh, beyond measure, and so we we think of these things as we present uh, our offering to you, Father. We pray that, that you would accept them that uh, that that we have given uh, freely and. Uh, with joy in our hearts. Father, we pray that, that uh, the, the funds that are given are uh, effective in, in expanding your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Understanding to do and say and be the 
the way that you would want us to be. We pray for the Christians of the world over, Father. There's always tribulation. There's always issues going on. We pray for those Christians who are away from us, part of our families. Give them the strength to stay strong in your word and in your might. Father, we pray for leaders of this land that you've given them wisdom and the understanding to honor you in their decisions. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we leave this assembly shortly, that you would give us a mind and a heart to love and serve you, and that it would not be about us, but be about you, that we would be servants to each other, to love and to respect and to care for each other as you would want. Again, we pray that you would forgive our sins. We are so thankful for Jesus the Christ, our Savior and your Son, and what he has done for us. Help us to do those things that are right on your side. And follow we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning. We have just a few announcements that we want to share with you. And here are some of our more recent developments and names that are on our prayer list. We want to remember our friend and brother Kevin Ballard. He's in the hospital after an attack of pancreatitis, and his blood pressure is elevated and dangerously high. And that's the report that we have from Kelly. And certainly we want to remember Kevin and Kelly and all of their family in our prayers that the doctors might soon find a way to address and treat this particular flare-up. Our prayer is that it's nothing more than that. But whatever the doctors discover and the treatment that they're able to administer, we'll want to remember Kevin and Kelly and the family. We also want to remember Sister Elsie Clark's family. Her daughter in Alabama has tested positive for the COVID-19. And just as soon as I say that, you know how very serious it can be, potentially. And she is under quarantine, and all of the Owen and the Walker families are also under quarantine. So we'll be hoping and praying and trusting that perhaps the virus will not be so serious in its effects. Maybe it's only limited to her and not the loved ones that she's been around, but we'll let you know whenever we hear an update and pass that along to you. Some of you have been wondering about funeral services, memorial services for our sister Edwina Bagwell, Barbara's mother that we lost last week. And as you know, the COVID virus situation has complicated that to a great deal. And the word is now that services will be held for Sister Edwina at a later time down in Texas. And that will be the family home and those matters. And we'll want to remember that in the days and the weeks ahead. Perhaps the Lord will shorten the time and the family will be able to gather soon and pay their last respects, and say goodbye. This is a hard time, and we'll want to remember all of them, and especially our sister Barbara. On another front, Barbara has checked in with her doctor. The most recent visit after her foot surgery, and he says that she's doing great. Everything is healing up. It'll still take another year or so for her to be finally up and at them and over this, but that at least is good news for Barbara. And we continue to remember those that are recovering from surgery. Dave Derryberry, Ed Mann, Glenn Ramsey, and Barbara, too, as she recovers from her surgery. Our sister Mona's twin sister Lona still under hospice care and that ongoing situation. And these days seem to drag along and 
we're remembering Lona and all of her loved ones in our prayer, our brother John Ryan, and facing the end stretch of his chemotherapy treatments, we hope, we pray, and soon our prayer will be that he will receive a good report and clear him at least for a time, and we'll let you know about that. And then Philip James down on the Navajo Reservation and the ongoing concerns with his eye, whether the doctors will operate or not. And that too is a situation somewhat up in the air. And yet Philip and Irita are truly in our prayers. Until the next time we all meet again, may the Lord bless and keep us all.